I'm Raj, uh, Raj Bhopal. I'm a professor of public health in this university. I'm also honorary consultant in public health in the NHS Scotland. I work for NHS Lothian. Well, at school I was always very interested in the broader issues and I did modern studies and that uh, I learned about government and the role of government and I learned about uh, apartheid and many other things, power and how it was exercised and uh, became very interested in the broader issues in life, philosophy, economics, history, um, politics and um, I wasn't sure what to do in medicine and I came into, when I applied for university I applied for philosophy, economics, um, politics and medicine probably the only person who has ever applied for those four subjects um, and uh, when I came here one of my first subjects in first year was um, uh, social science and medicine and uh, that was an optional subject, but for people who didn't have to do physics, I was one of those that didn't have to do physics because they did well at school. They gave you a choice, and one of the choices was social science and medicine. So I did that, learned a lot right from the first year about the broader issues in, in, in medicine beyond the treating of the individual patient, became interested. And then in my fourth year elective, we have two electives in those years. It was a six-year course. In the first year, I went off to uh, Northwest River and Labrador, and I worked as a fourth year medical student in a very small hospital where really there was no other doctor. It was run by nurses. So the medical students effectively were the doctors. And one of the things I had to do was home visits. And I did uh, home visits across the river where the, the Native uh, American or Native uh, Canadian populations lived. Um, the Indians, the, what they call the Indians, uh, the Native Indians of Canada. I think that would not be the proper terminology now, but that was the terminology then. And I also did home visits to this side of the river where the hospital was, where the white Canadians lived. And I saw a complete difference, a stark contrast in the kind of problems people were having. Over across the river, uh, there, the people lived in prefabricated houses where there was an open fire inside the house. Um, it's unbelievable. The amount of smoke inside the house. They had an open chimney at the top of the roof and the smoke was supposed to rise and go out. But it actually spilled over all over inside the house. The children were running around. And the kind of problems they had were running noses, uh, otitis media, which is infections of the ear, coughs, uh, pneumonias. On this side of the river, there was all the classic problems of angina, neurosis, sleeplessness. Completely different. And that got me really intrigued. And then in my fifth year elective, I went to India. I spent a month in the um, uh, Department of Medicine and a month in the Department of Community Medicine. And I gave myself a test. Which of these two departments seemed to be doing the more important work? And at the end of my two-month elective, there was absolutely no doubt that for India anyway, at that time, um, the Department of Community Medicine was doing the important work. So um, I came back from my India elective, resolved to do public health. Uh, the rest is largely history after about four years of um, medical training of various kinds to build up my experience and knowledge, and then started training in public health in 1983 in Glasgow. Well, the un undoubted advantage of uh, having a medical background is that uh, you've got a very broad education. I mean, there's no doubt in medicine you learn chemistry, you learn biochemistry, you learn pathology, you learn pharma pharmacology, you, you learn about people, and it's just, there's virtually nothing that's not covered. For me, the biggest disadvantage has been that uh, as you go through medicine, you lose your mathematics. So having come into public health and epidemiology, quite a strong um, strength in numeracy is required. And um, I, although I think I still retain many of the concepts that I learned in mathematics at school, the actual ability to um, solve uh, algebraic equations and that sort of thing, which I would love to have back, has largely gone. Uh, yeah, when I started in 1983, public health was largely a dirty word, um, not just in uh, medicine. But even in the general public, it was totally out of fashion. And now public health is front page headlines all over the world. I mean, I'm not sure if it's healthy. We seem to have swung too far. 
I think the general public is feeling a bit bemused. I think uh, to a large extent they feel they can ignore it. How we actually solve that problem, I'm not quite sure. It needs a different kind of approach. Maybe fewer messages so that people, are, when, you, when you're absolutely certain that a certain message actually does apply, then we need to take some serious action. What, what's happening now is that we're getting two or three very big messages every week. Uh, and that is just too many. No one can handle that. Well, the opportunity is very obvious, and that is that uh, there's so few people working in this field and there's so much to do. It's an endless challenge and endless opportunities. Um, wow, what a research agenda we have here, what a service agenda, what a policy agenda. It's wide open. You could be occupied for a lifetime just examining, let's say, the ethnic variations that have been shown up in cancer. It's never mind anything else. Um, you could set up a research unit with a thousand people in it and still keep everybody busy. So there's so much to do. The, uh, the, the problem is that there's a lot of circularity. It's very prone to uh, government policy. Um, one government is really interested in inequalities and reducing inequalities and looking after um, the diversity in the country. And then the next government comes in and they're not interested. They change the law, they change the policy or they alter the funding. That's one. So there's a lot of circularity in this field. And um, the second thing is that as a research scientist, as an epidemiologist, I have to do some stuff that is very basic. I mean, it's already been done for the general population, establishing disease patterns. It's very basic science. Um, just collecting the data to say, well, this is the incidence of disease in this group, and that's the incidence of disease in another group. So it is very basic. So that does mean that I have to spend a lot of my time doing basic epidemiology. Um, so there are some challenges, but it's going to come back in. It's never going to go away anyway, because the whole world is becoming a multi-ethnic world. So this area of work is going to expand and grow. That question is a bit like asking me, oh Raj, you've got four sons, which of them are you most proud of and why? And you know, it's not possible in an academic career as long as mine. But um, I have picked out, nonetheless, I have picked out four things. So I thought I'd have one thing for every one of my sons. Firstly, I wrote this book, Concepts of Epidemiology, and um, it's a crowded market writing books on epidemiology, basic books. It's a sort of postgraduate. I wrote it as the first textbook a postgraduate might want to read if they're interested in epidemiology. And then the second book, and the second big book I've written, I've written other books as well, mostly multi-author books, but the two books I've written entirely on my own. Uh, this book came out it's, uh, as ethnicity, and ethnicity, Race and Health, and then last year it came out in the second edition as Migration, uh, Ethnicity, Race and Health. I could see that migration was becoming a very big issue and it's interrelated, so I wrote this book as my second thing. The two bits of research I'd really like to maybe point out to are one bit of work I did in Newcastle while I was professor there, and that was a paper we published in the BMJ in 1999. It's a very simple paper. It's called Heterogeneity of Cardiovascular Risk Factors in Indians, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Up till then, people had noticed that there's a big issue with cardiovascular disease in South Asian populations, but they treated them as one, as Asians or South Asians. Anyway, we got this paper published in the BMJ, and um, ever since then, the idea of treating South Asians and Asians as one group has virtually evaporated. So I'll pick that paper, and then finally I've got to pick a paper that reported on our PADOSA trial, Prevention of Diabetes and Obesity in South Asians trial. I suppose one of the reasons I have to pick on it is because uh, I started thinking about that study probably in 2004, we started planning that study in 2005, we got it funded in 2006 and uh, seven years later, in December 2013, our main paper was published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. In an era which extols economic inequalities um, but decries health inequalities, it's really impossible to make progress. Those policies have to be aligned because they're going in different diverging directions. It's a bit like a swimmer who is able to swim at three miles an hour, swimming upstream 
uh, when the river is coming downstream at five miles an hour. So you can't do it, really. All you can do is wear yourself out. So I see that as a massive challenge. The other challenge I've already alluded to is the movement of people across the world. Uh, we've already seen in the last 250 years the urbanization of much of the world. That urbanization is proceeding at pace. It's happening in India, it's happening in China, it's happening in Africa, uh, Latin America. And that is a massive challenge, the urbanization of the world. I think it's going to bring huge benefits that we haven't even begun to consider. Uh, one of the benefits was that more trees grew in the world last year than were cut down because uh, the forests are being reclaimed by nature in, in China and Russia because of urbanization. People have left, they're not farming the land, so nature grows those trees again. Um, so there will be advantages, but the other change is this uh, internationalization of the world. Uh, we, we, in the UK, for example, London particularly, or other parts of the UK, we've seen a truly multi-ethnic society. Or we see a truly multi-ethnic society if you go to a place like Vancouver or New York, San Francisco, we're seeing it in London, uh, Paris, and that is the future. Uh, a lot of people don't like it. Uh, there will be civil wars, there will be strife, uh, there will be burning of hostels, there will be wars, but that is the future. And um, in a hundred years, everyone, and virtually everyone in the whole world, will be living in societies that look a bit like London. And that is a hard thing for many people to take. Um, this racism will have to be consigned to the historic dustbin. But the world is going to change and people have to learn how to live in this new world. And people can live in it. Uh, London seems to be an incredibly successful and harmonious place. And many of these multi-ethnic cities are indeed uh, very successful and harmonious. Uh, Vancouver is repeatedly voted as one of the most desirable places to live in the world. It's a very multi-ethnic city. So I, I do see that as a second huge challenge. If um, I could, at the wave of a wand, uh, stop the growth of any substances that are highly addictive, um, I would stop it. Uh, I don't know what would be in my basket of highly addictive substances. Let's say we said the five most highly addictive substances known to human beings would be um, confined, uh, would be, uh, we would stop growing or making them. Um, I think that would do us a lot of good because when we, when we become addicted to things, we lose our freedom. And freedom is one of the most prized things we, we enjoy as human beings. And uh, to give up our freedom um, through becoming addicted to things is not, is not good. I think we should be advocates where we have the evidence to back up uh, our advocacy. If we don't have the evidence to back up our advocacy, then we should be, if we really believe in that, we should be seeking the evidence in some sort of dispassionate way. And once we have the evidence, then we should try and do something about it. If I wasn't allowed to be in academia or medicine, I'd probably be a businessman. Because I came from a business family and uh, my father had businesses and he wanted me in the business. Like many plans, it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was because uh, I was good at school. I was academically able. And uh, my brother, who had just entered medical school, said to my father, no, he's not coming into the business. He's staying on in school. But yes, I probably would have been in business. And who knows, I might have been a multi-billionaire by now. <laughs> or my business might have crashed. <laughs> I might be on the streets begging. So uh, who knows what would have happened. But that, life could have gone in many different directions, and um, well, that's the exciting thing about life. So, uh, for non fiction, I picked The Ancestor's Tale by Richard Dawkins because it tells you everything about the uh, evolution of life on, on the earth that you would ever want to know in, in a brilliant way. And for fiction, I picked The Magus uh, by John Fowles because I found that totally mesmerizing book. Um, then albums, Hari Prasad Charesia playing the Indian flute. Um, then uh, Beethoven's violin concerto, the slow movement. And then um, Carol King tapestry has to be my 
if not my all-time favourite album, certainly in up there. And for a movie, I've only picked one, so that's good. Uh, I Am Love by, uh, well, the, the actress there is Tilda Swinton.